The entire team at Emsolation want to acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We want to recognise that we are recording and telling our stories on the stolen land of our country's first storytellers. We wish to pay our respects to all Wurundjeri elders and ancestors and to extend that respect to any First Nations peoples who listen to Emsolation. We recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's continued connection to the land and waters of this country and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Always was, always will be. The house is clean, but my parents are going to find the dildo in the bag hanging on the back of my door. And Michael Lucas. Don't make assumptions and we do not objectify. We just quietly, when we're healthy enough, start to write the fan fiction. This is Emsolation. They actually wrote pictures kept a tight on the file. Official diagnosis, tight. You're in Emsolation. Clack. Clack. Bette Midler, Hello Dolly. Broadway's yeah. greatest musical. Oh, the man from Hello Dolly died. I know. He is so beloved. I know. So many people that I love and admire mm. loved and admired him. And he was, a, I think he was about our age. Yes. And apparently like one of the absolute mainstays of Broadway and clearly beloved by all um, ensemble cast that he's worked with and crews and, and yeah, died suddenly. It was and horrific. It was, it was something like... He knew only had two months. He found a very rare form of cancer mm. um, and and was making beautiful phone calls and telling people how he felt. Mm. And then We've he was really gone. Gavin started Krill. dark. Gavin Krill. Uh, we have started dark and we're going to be digging further down the tunnel. <laughs> Welcome to- I hope you enjoyed the light relief of the episode. Yes. No, look, this episode is, look, it's jam-packed with real life stuff. The stuff of life. That's right. Is what we shall call this episode. Yeah. Because I'm not afraid to roll right to the edge and yeah. sometimes peer over into the abyss. Yeah. And our guest today. Yes. We have a very special guest has launched himself headfirst into that, that abyss many times. And brought back imagery. And brought back imagery. Gaga has released an absolute stinker and Robbie Williams is an ape. That's correct. But the first thing I want to talk about is, well, the name of the show. Hello and welcome to Emsolation. My name is Em Rossiano. I'm a writer, a singer, a stand-up comedian, a maximalist power queen, a neurodivergent magic brain and a podcaster. And together with my best friend since I was 11, International Emmy Award nominated Mr. Michael Lucas. Hello. I bring you this podcast every week. It is a little bit different this week. Um, yeah. Because I need to talk through... A, a medical emergency that I experienced over the weekend. And then once we've come out of that, <laughs> we will be beautifully um, dovetailing, dovetailing, pirouetting into, uh, into a discussion about this amazing book, Living with Bipolar, which it as has you can imagine, a joyful page, a joyful page. Yeah. No, it is uplifting. It's actually. Extremely by uplifting. End. By the end. Compared it's to my journey. It's a journey. Well, <laughs> yours, yours. Mine is typically me. It's on brand. Yeah. It's certainly on brand. Mm. Um, we thought Em wasn't going to be coming to the show today, should we just say. Like, I, I, we were, Ben and I were prepped, prepared. I was actually quite surprised. When she said she's coming in, I was like, <laughs> whoa. Okay. I need to unburden myself. Okay. And what better way to do it? Then on a hot mic. Correct. <laughs> The thing is, though, I've tried to talk about it with people and it's too hard for me to get through it. So last night at 1am, I typed 1,831 words and purged myself of... The experience. Yes. Which you're still sort of trapped in in a way. I am trapped in in, in, in a way. But I'm going to read to you what I wrote. I haven't done any editing or scraping. I don't know what is here. Any context for this or we're going to absolute raw dog into it? Raw dog. Okay. Coming in dry. <laughs> Hang on to your ankles, Australia and international emsolators. Here we go. Starts in classic low-key Rossiano style. <laughs> a few days ago, I was rushed to emergency in an ambulance. For a period of time, I thought I was going to die. In the end, I was okay, but someone needs to tell my body that. 
story time. <laughs> Last Sunday, I drove to a Whole Foods supermarket about 40 minutes from where I live to try and find my eldest daughter some good gluten and dairy-free options. Good, because she does get the IBS at times. She's developed a serious allergy to both and has been living off rice and vegetables and being thoroughly miserable about it. I woke up Sunday determined to help her and began researching the best place to go. And after a bit of looking, I found a gluten-free Mecca not too far from us and headed there after lunch. It was a successful and very expensive outing. I managed to locate both vegan feta and mozzarella that promised to melt, a thing the majority of vegan cheeses struggle to do, and a variety of other substitutes for her favourite foods. I then wandered around the vintage market in the building next door. Don't think that fact was lost on me when I was in autism-powered research overdrive into gluten-free supermarkets. I noticed that it was almost five o'clock and I knew I needed to get myself home before the night air set in so I could prepare everyone for the return to kinder and school for the week ahead. Mm. I've just lost all the spit in my mouth. <clears throat> Why is this so hard? <sighs> because you're... Yeah. It is making you feel the exact same things that you yeah. felt at the time. Because when I go back and write things as I want to talk to Xavier about, I, I have to relive them to, to do them justice. Mm, mm, mm. I pulled out onto the busy highway. The market was near and about two minutes into my drive, I felt a strong pain in my chest, akin to someone pushing a tennis ball just below my sternum on the right side of my body. Now, my body is usually a symphony of strange aches and pains. I'm an ex-junior athlete, 45 and in perimenopause. So I gave it a bit of a rub and tried to keep driving. As I pulled up to a red light, I noticed my right arm began to feel full and tingly. I gave it a shake and tried to wiggle my fingers, but then realised they were stuck in a claw shape. And I realised very quickly that I needed to pull my car over before it got any worse. I managed to get across two lanes and parked my car on the side of the highway I'd been driving on. I attempted to take a few breaths but couldn't get enough air in. My heart started racing and I could hear it loudly in my ears. And then the proper panic set in. And around then, I knew I needed to get myself out of the car and try and flag someone down. I managed to press the button on my seatbelt, but as I tried to lift my right leg, I couldn't get it to cooperate. It felt heavy, almost like it belonged to someone else. I sat there in my car on the side of a busy road, trapped in my body, unable to help myself and desperately trying to figure out what I needed to do next. The truth is I wasn't in that much physical pain, but my mental state was a whole other story. I'm going to die, I said out loud to no one. I've never experienced that kind of terror before. It was all consuming. The kind you know you can't fight and so you have absolutely no other option but to surrender to it. I tried to remember what I needed to do next. I should call an ambulance, I thought. No, I corrected myself. That's too dramatic. Narrator. It was not too dramatic. <laughs> she should have called an ambulance. <laughs> Folks, I was semi-paralysed with a pain in my chest and an irregular heartbeat on the side of a road and I'm such a people pleaser that I was too self-conscious to phone a fucking ambulance. I'd never been in an ambulance or had to call one for myself or anyone else. And in that moment, I genuinely felt embarrassed that I'd even considered it. Mm. I asked Siri to phone my husband. He answered and I tried to explain what was happening. I told him that I was worried I was going to die and that he needed to tell the girls and Elio that I loved them. But he firmly told me that I was not going to die and that he was on his way to find me. He asked me where I was but I suddenly felt very confused. I knew where I was, but I was having trouble finding the words to communicate that information to him. And then my vision started strobing and he said he was hanging up and calling an ambulance. I said, no, don't call an ambulance. It's okay. I just need to calm myself down enough to drive myself mm -hmm. to the emergency <laughs> department. Oh. You see, that was progress. Mm. I was actually conceding that I okay. probably needed medical attention. Baby steps. Just to recap, chest pain, yeah. irregular heartbeat, blurred vision, tingling and numb limbs, breathing issues, disorientation and apparent aphasia, trouble speaking. Mm -hmm. Didn't need an ambulance. Mm -hmm. No cause for alarm. That's nah, fine. <laughs> Shut up, Siri. She's, she's been there for you before. Luckily, my husband, Scott, ignored me. 
and said he was driving to me. He could see me on the Stalker app that we used to track the children. I knew this would come round to, and again, a ringing endorsement of the Stalker app, <laughs> as if we needed another one. Stalker app. And, Could have saved your life. Um, he called Triple O. I hung up and the I'm going to die terror quickly returned. And I thought about genuinely how glad I was I cleaned my house before I left. Yeah, I can attest. I was there on Friday night. The cleaning was in process. It was phase one, but it was happening. I was going through an OCD episode. I've been having some mental health issues of late and usually my house is the beneficiary of... Stability through cleaning. Correct. Mm. Um, And then an unknown number rang my mobile and for the first time in my life I answered it. I can can attest. She (laughs) does not like... She does not like an undeclared number. Does I, don't not like, like it. I don't even like declared numbers. When you true. call, I answer with, what's wrong? That is very true, no matter what. <laughs> it was an emergency. It was emergency services. A calm young woman told me that an ambulance was on its way to me, that she'd spoken to my husband, Scott, and that it would be arriving any minute. She asked me then to tell me what had happened and I attempted to recap my symptoms and how that arrived. But again, I was having trouble speaking it was so strange. I I could feel the words in my mouth. I could shape them. I could see the word, mm. but I couldn't say it. Mm. I could describe it. Mm. But say I was looking for road, I, I would say the black hard thing that cars are driving on, but I could not reach in and grab road. Mm. It was so strange. Mm. And I would say to my arm, I, my, I could say, just move, move. And... It would sl- slightly kind of. It was the most. I, I just this made didn't, me have trouble breathing. Right oh, <laughs> well, that was the whole point. My, I was hyperventilating. I was going into complete panic. Mm. Could hear my heart in my ears. And um, she was amazing. It was just the lady on the phone. She was so kind, and she realised I was having trouble speaking, and she stopped asking me questions and just said, "Amelia, I'll stay on the line with you until the paramedics are at your car door." Mm. And I kept an eye on my rearview mirror and within a minute or so I saw the red and blue flashing lights of an ambulance and a small amount of relief entered my body. And I told the operator that I could see the ambulance, but she said, please just stay with me on the line until they are actually with you at your car. I watched the ambulance speed down the road toward me and then pass me and then panic returned when I saw it go up and over the hill away from me. It wasn't my ambulance. Oh, But I hope to myself the person that they were going to was okay. Mm. I always worry when I see ambulances because I think about where they're going and I worry about that person and that person's had to get, their family's had to get the phone call that your loved one's in an ambulance and I've had that phone call and it's the worst phone call ever. And then I realised my family was going to have to get that phone call. 30 seconds later, I saw more red and blue lights tearing through the intersection behind me and they screeched to a halt behind my car. A young man got out of the ambulance, ran to my car door, opened it up and he said, my name is Ben and I'm going to help you. He said, can you tell me what's happening? So I tried again to explain, but he then realised I was having trouble speaking. He could see I couldn't move my arm or leg and helped me straight out of the car and onto a gurney. His partner, Elise, came out to assist as well and they got me into the ambulance really quickly, hooked me up to a heart monitor and began all the checks. They were basically trying to figure out if it was a heart attack or a stroke. They ruled out heart attack due to my weak limbs and other medical factors I have no business trying to explain here. Then they agreed that they were very concerned about the possibility of a stroke and they decided on Box Hill Hospital as the place they needed to take me. Just as we were getting ready to leave, Scott arrived and answered a few questions and was told to follow the ambulance to the hospital. Elise sat in the back with me and she did an excellent job of keeping me calm. We realised that we had the same birthday exactly 10 years apart. She's 89, I'm 79, Uh. 1st of March. I know, what a ledge. And um, she also managed to get an IV cannula into my arm without me even noticing. Oh, and I have to, job I know. Sensory issues. I know. She was, well, I told her I had ADHD um, and I was autistic and she understood what that meant. Mm. They dimmed the lights, they turned everything down. They mm, were mm. asking only, like, they were, they knew how to deal with me. Mm, and she did. Mm. She shoved a whole ass cannula in my vein while I was. Mm. thought I was having a stroke and I must emphatically say that both of them were incredible from the moment they encountered me and honestly please pay paramedics all of the money whatever they want just to hand it over we arrived at the ED of Box Hill Hospital and I was taken in for an immediate CT scan like they took me in there was there was no delay it was I was I was kind of 
a bit out of it, but also just exploding with terror. I, I just, again, I, I've never had this kind of fear in my life. And as we know, I live in a neat constant state of fear. Mm, mm, like mm. I, I just vibra- I just vibrate at that frequency. Mm. But this is just a whole other level. Is but- CT the one where you go into the thing? Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yes. so they assisted me onto the bed and I was told I was having a CT scan first. And then if they needed to, I do a CT scan with contrast, which is a dye they put in through your IV, oh, yes, yes, which yes. illuminates yes. the organ they're trying yes. to see. They did the first CT and said they needed to do the contrast. The contrast one, which set me off straight away. Ben came over and put his arm on mine and he said, it's okay, they're just doing it as a precaution. And then he said, you cold, I'm going to get you a heated blanket. So Ben then went and found me a heated blanket. Now this ben is still the Ambo. Is the Ambo. Ben hasn't left my side since I he got there. I didn't realise that. I thought they were like... I didn't know either. Mm. But he stayed with me the whole time. Right. So he put the warm blanket on me. When they do the... the, the I don't know if anyone's had it, but you feel like you've pissed your pants. So I'm lying there thinking, fucking great. Because he was hot too. I've, I'm sure it wasn't going through your head. Don't I'm not give it sorry. away. Don't give it away. But we do not. Objectify. First responders. Public servants as well. Don't worry, I've written a whole paragraph about how he was. Anyway. <laughs> gets me the blanket. They whoosh me in and out of the machine. They put the dye in me. And I'm kind of there, unable to move. There's a team of doctors there. They've got neurology in, looking very concerned. And I'm like... Fuck, I'm having a fucking stroke. Mm. I'm 45. I'm having a stroke. Um, I was just like incandescent with anxiety. And um, once they'd finished it all, they said, you know, they'd have a look and let me know. I got put back onto the gurney and taken back out into ED. And Ben came to me and said, we're, we're trying to find you a bed. He said, um, just give me a second. And he, um, he went back into the room where the doctors were and he kind of hovered. And then he came back to me and he said, it's okay. And I'm like, he said, I was an ED nurse for seven years at Austin. He said, I'm like, this is, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, this is his hood. This is is why he knows Mm. where everything is and he Mm. knows what I, and he said, they're going to come and tell you that, but I just wanted to let you know that they (sighs) haven't found it. Oh, Ben! (sighs) Side note. Okay. When I tell you that in any other circumstance, if I'd have encountered Ben in the world, Mm. it would have been a dazzling and noteworthy experience. (laughs) Let's just say later that night, as Scott kissed me goodbye, uh, he leant over and said, that Ambo was one of the most beautiful men I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Scott's always good at acknowledging these things. I respect it. To which I told Scott, we should never objectify our first responders. But when I tell you the deep set blue eyes, yeah. tanned, tall, kind of scruffy hair, yeah. moustache, yeah. like, oh, my God. And I think, I don't want to assume one yeah. of you, I think, Okay. That, no, I, I, I don't do, want to assume. I, I, I do know that amongst the paramedic community, they're, 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 there's quite high rates of And was it ED arsenic. nurse? But well, we do we not don't make assumptions make and assumptions. we do not objectify. We do not make assumptions objectify. We just quietly, when we're healthy enough, start to write the fan fiction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll just tell you, Elise and Ben, Elise was just this amazing, like she, she you couldn't have typed, if I had to go to central casting and pick, mm. The two Ambos I'd want to turn up to, my character, it mm. would be the efficient, strong, um, 35-year-old, sensible woman and the Errol Flynn-esque, mm. like they were the perfect combination. Mm, mm. I don't want to make assumptions about Elise either. No, I think you just did. But <laughs> after I found out I was okay, I was a regular chatty Cathy, you know. I mean, I still had no idea what was happening. I still couldn't move my arms or legs or form coherent sentences, but it wasn't a stroke. I'd Weird. take it. So I, I waited in the ED um, and, you know, I had to – people were coming in and out and doing various tests and then they decided to keep me in overnight for observation and um, long story short, it was a fucking migraine. Now, is that just because they rule out everything else and they go, it must have been a migraine, or can you actually, like, definitively prove it's a migraine? They can't definitively prove it. So I was thinking about, I used to watch House. Remember that show, House? Oh, do I ever? It was, like, one of my all-time favorite shows. Hugh Laurie. Hugh Laurie, clearly autistic. Yeah. Um, What's the diagnosis? Yeah, and, like, would work Mm. through, and sometimes... Oh, and you'd always get middle episode that he's on the... Whatever he's on the middle episode, you're like, well, it's not going to be that because he's got to veer off into another... Yeah. But it would always be one bizarre twist of fate. Yeah. Like... 
He saw a dung beetle in the corner of his eye and the reflective red shell of it reminded him of a time he saw a berry in Africa and the effect that berry had on a rhinoceros that ate it. It must be this rare and strange disease. Mm. It was always, every episode, it was always mm. something like, you know. Were you I mean? hoping for something rarer than what it was? I was hoping Dr. House was going to walk in. Mm. No, I wasn't hoping for rare. No. I was hoping for a definitive, it was, not a In fact, it's kind of best case scenario. Oh, right. We think it, right, we right. think it was an atypical migraine, mm-hmm, which mm-hmm. mimicked the symptoms of a stroke. But also, you had been sick. I had nausea for five. I'd been vomiting hectically yes, at which home. was confusing because I'd had the... Yeah. I thought, no, mine was food poisoning. I didn't give it to you, did I? But now that makes sense in the context of yeah, the migraine coming Yeah, I was really up. sick at home Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I, I couldn't, I slept for three days. I was vomiting. Well, that's very migraine mm. So, um, yeah, after all that, a headache. But to call the migraine I experienced a yes. headache is like calling Well, and actually it didn't technically have that no. Ache in the head. No. Not. But I mean, I had various aches, but the, not that one. The migraines I've been having are like, it's like calling Niagara Falls a trickle of water. Like, it's not a headache. It's a fucking life event. And pray tell, this may be connected to the change of life, is in some ways exacerbated, or have they always been of this pitch and intensity? Well, the migraines only started since I started going through menopause. So thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um. So it's not a stroke. I'm okay. I do think it's also worth saying, so even though it, it, you hear like stroke in your 40s, actually, you, I know some Well, they did keep a, saying she's so young, so healthy. I know two so, people that had strokes in their 30s. I just want you to know that. Yeah. They kept saying. Oh, well, you are. Look at you're you. are so young, you're so healthy. Yeah. And I kept saying only in a hospital. They actually scene. wrote bitches kept it tight on the file. A, official <laughs> diagnosis, tight. <laughs> <laughs> but I, only Banging. in a hospital, only Stacked. in a hospital setting, am I young and healthy? Let's be real. Yeah. Did anyone ask about your hair? They should have. Well, we'll get to Unless that. the hair, the hair can't trigger a migraine, can it? No, no. But oh. the hair is <laughs> an issue for another reason. What too attractive for people? Well, that too. I have to get an MRI. That's not funny. <laughs> and what? You can't have the hair when you have the MRI. Why? Do the metal clips in there? That is not funny, but also... (laughs) If you were writing this in a TV show, in the plotting room, everyone would be like... Can I just say, you really set up this saga and I did think it was going to have an (laughs) unspectacular end. I felt it was just going to be you come in one day and you're like, I got sick of it. But to think that finally it crescendos in an MRI and the forced removal of you. (laughs) But I mean, do I need the MRI? (laughs) If I'm going to (laughs) go... Go out hot. Do I need it? Yeah. Do I? I mean, do I need it? I mean, the CT was clear. What's the MRI going to show us? Well, more. I would say you just want to. You just. I th- <laughs> I, I'm going to say, put your brain above, your admittedly spectacular hair extensions. You'd never know they're even hair extensions. They've done a beautiful job. But if the they hair have, which is lair, can't they? Can't they temporarily take it out and then put it back in? Well, I don't understand. Or maybe I could travel with them. <laughs> Please welcome my hair team. Undo the hair. Yeah. In I go. And I'll come out like fucking Cinderella. No, Sandy from Greece when the birds fly in and dress her at the start of it. They can just fly in and reattach oh. the hair. I can be covered up so yeah. no one sees me with my, in my no hair face. Uh, that's not what you look like without. I'm just being. Dramatic. This is for comedy purposes. Okay, yeah. Of course I'm going to get the fucking MRI. But these are thoughts I did have. Do I really need to? The thing is, oh, my computer's gone flat. <laughs> the thing is, I'm okay. I'm not going to die. I didn't die. But I just wish somebody would inform my body of that, as I said right at the top. Did you have a different, you were like that before? Yeah, I'm. You're braced. I'm having horrendo like Melrose Place flashbacks. You know those terrible flashbacks, the 90s shows we loved? You with a- mm, jerky camera. And then strange sh- lighting. With like, yeah, and yeah. Vaseline on the lens. Ooh, yeah, strobe bit of strobe yeah, happening. The blue, bit of blue light. Yeah, I'm someone dead might wander in. Yeah, well. Mm. And I'm, I, I, I'm, my body and my brain and my psyche all went through the emotions of thinking I was going to die. Mm. And I, I wish I could just go back to five o'clock on Saturday a.m. and soothe her and say, hey, it's fine. It's okay. Mm. But it doesn't change the fact that even though I'm okay, there was a period of time where my body and brain genuinely thought I was never going to see my kids again. Mm, mm. I, you know, thank God my house was clean. Thank 
Thank God my hair looked great, but draw sorted out, I presume. Genuinely, yeah. And the other thing is, I thank can't God your hair looked great. I'm say this. The other thing is, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> We've, I've finally got myself a cleaner, a lovely cleaner. Yeah. And I, when I, this is such a fucking sidestep. When I, I'm one of the only three female comedians who's ever been allowed to perform at the Laird, which is a men's yes, all yes, male yes. bear yes. Collingwood. leather yes. club. Yes. To thank me for my performance, they gave me a large black dildo as a souvenir. <laughs> yeah. And I realised that my new cleaner was coming and the large black dildo sat in my underwear drawer. Just yeah. like, it's way too big for me to use. I would do permanent damage. Mm. I'd need more than an ambulance. It's just like a funny little trophy. Mm, mm. But she doesn't know that. Mm. So I popped it in a canvas bag and had been carrying it around with me around the house from room to room. <laughs> and Jill said to me, why are you carrying your tote bag around? And I said... I was just, just, just sick of carrying. I'm just sick of being a pack horse. Anyway, in it was a big black dildo because I didn't want my cleaner to find it. And I did as I was did sitting you, you there. You didn't my take it to the was... organic store, did you? No. Oh. But I hung it on the back of my door. And I did for a moment as I'm my life flashing before my eyes think the house is clean. But fuck, my parents are going to find the dildo big in the bag hanging dildo. on the back of my door. <laughs> and if they did, if everything went work to as bad as it could have gone, I would have said... I know for a fact that she wanted this to be hollowed out. She wanted her ashes in the dildo. It's true. <laughs> That's what. And then at the end of it, we we're going to present the ashes filled dildo and say, guys, no. this is what she wanted. <laughs> but you nearly got a phone call from me. <laughs> Bitch. Go get the dildo. Get the dildo from the back. <laughs> Anyway, I love that. Yeah, I, I'm. I, I feel very proud. I think I've got a bit of PTSD that, from Sunday. I would have done it too. I know. You're and I would person. have understood that that's more important than anything else that could happen at You're this time. You're the only person I could have called. I think Scott would have found his way to it. <laughs> <laughs> I think he would have thought it was notable, but he's he's pretty good. He's not he's not he's not flummoxed by things like that. It is a hard one to explain. To be frank, the explanation does sound like even I'm a little bit like, really, is that what you? No, it's the truth. Okay, no, well. Mm. I don't want things up my bits. Don't even want my husband up there. My big black rubber thing. Anyway, also that ends well. I'm not dead, but I'm fucking traumatized. <laughs> mm. Well, you've loosened slightly. Not really. That's the story. Wow. Let's well, talk the- about bipolar. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Coming up next, we'll do some reshuffling. Uh, Fred, give me this beautiful book. A friend and uh, colleague of Michael Lucas's is joining us, Xavier Coy. Coy? Coy. Xavier Coy has written this incredible, is a bit like staring into the sun for me reading. I'm just going to Yes, there were many passages. He takes you inside the experience of what it is to be living with bipolar. And there are many times where I did think. Do it to camera. It's incredible. (laughs) I I suddenly felt like I was on play school. Wow. Well, that's what they used this to do. This would be a dark episode of fucking Fly School. But they did used to do that, right? But I always was impressed how and they could this really hold children it. children yeah. is the demon that will appear. This your sleep paralysis is the manic demon, demon. That will come to you at night when you try to close your eyes and sleep. This, children, is hopelessness. <laughs> Something you'll experience the minute you become an adult. Actually, I should go like that, shouldn't I, James? It's beautiful. Yeah, there we go. Xavier's so joining us next. And then after that, we'll be heading to the sealed section to talk about Gaga's new movie and Robbie Williams as an ape. See you soon. Welcome back. <laughs> I love this. I'm just going to sit here and just do like what you do, but I need to undo a few more buttons. Oh, I did expose a nipple unintentionally. The last well, time we had a guest here, Michael exposed a nipple because he had so many buttons undone. It's true. It was What she is leaving out is that she told me to undo the buttons. I did. I'm an enabler when it comes to buttons. She led this lamb to slaughter. <laughs> but we are very thrilled to welcome Xavier Coy. So Xavier um, is a friend of mine because Xavier worked on five bedrooms he is this incredibly prolific writer and the prolific that's a clue we'll we'll talk about that very fast prolific writer uh who came into our writer's room as like a junior person helping with the plotting and then and then went on to become a fully fledged screenwriter on the show right before the world ended in fact the episode you wrote of five bedrooms was what was actually shooting when covid 
hit. And then oh, right. Xavier is Sydney based, so then everything fell apart. Everything was stopped. And then eventually, sometime down the track, you said that you had been diagnosed with bipolar, which I'll admit came as a bit of a shock to me because I would just, you just seem sort of, I would have even described you as like mood wise, struck me as very reliably sort of effervescent upbeat. Granted, I only saw you really in this specific plotting room circumstance. And in retrospect, I was a bit like, it was weird how he could write scripts in 48 hours. That's not a standard situation. Same. But I didn't really, I didn't really. So now, of course, I go back in time and thinking that all those times, because writing rooms are like long days meetings, like it's like a, could be a form of torture. And so one of the first things I'm wondering is in that period of time, obviously all of these symptoms were happening. Were you completely carefully masking and managing all of that that whole period of time? Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. So were you, I mean, you were, you were good. Because because this is like an eight-hour day in a room, fluorescent lighting overhead. And if you're feeling half the things that we're describing in this book, I, w- I don't know how I would have to leave the room. Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. Like when you know you're going to be like, it, it, you know, it, it fluctuates your emotional states as well. Like if you're hypermanic or if you're depressive, like some periods you are fine. Yeah. And that's when you sort of gaslight yourself and convince yourself that actually I'm always like this. It's, it's not, it's not bad. Like I don't need to get this attended to. But then when you are like hypermatic and you're just like, fuck, I can't sit still. Yeah. It's just like I just need to move around. I need to do anything that's not this. Yeah. And so that's at hard. that, so your narrative in your head in that time was no, I'm fine. It's just sometimes I go won't sleep for a few days. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, or I'll just cry ordering a coffee. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. These were all very foreign concepts you're describing to me. I want to ask you, Xavier, I would like you to take me back to when you were a kid. Yeah. What was it like moving through the world with your brain? Like what do you remember? So my memory is actually pretty ordinary so I, I have like lovely embarrassing moments that I can just pop up out of nowhere and go oh great I relive that like mm-hmm. it's happening now mm-hmm. like at 3am in the morning when you're feeling insecure well that's mm-hmm. what happens to me yeah mm-hmm. but so I, I have like weird patches of mm-hmm. memories I've got you know I write about like my earliest memories of like my dad for example is like him saying, you'll never be as smart as me, you'll never be as good as me, you'll never be as good looking as me, you'll never be as successful as me. They're my earliest memories. Wow, so he sounds like a great guy. Yeah, we're really close. We're just <laughs> yeah. I'm really hoping he's still in your life. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah, great. He disappeared six years ago. So that was... He stayed okay, in too long. Took a turn. Um, <laughs> oh, not dead. Oh, okay. No, okay. not disappeared from my <laughs> no, life. Good. No. He's yeah. a light, I assume. But that's a pretty Let horrible... Us know. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't reach out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a pretty horrible foundation because like all of us, we build our sense of self-worth and, you know, who, who we think we are via our parents. Yeah. So, so that's your first message about yourself. Yes. Right. So that trying to uh, like reestablish what a normal relationship with myself is, yeah. like that took a lot of, that took a lot of work and also uh, again, I write in the book just at the start. I just to provide a bit of context. You know, it's not a book about that, but I mm. felt like the context was important. He used to sort of um, play fight. He'd say like, "There'll be three hits: me hitting you, you hitting the deck, and the ambulance hitting a hundred. And Jeez. those were my earliest memories. And so, you know, when you're already an anxious yeah. kid, like that's that's hard to sort of. Well, I guess it's hard for any kid to know what to say to that. Like, yeah. So. And, and you were, th- this was all manifesting in you as well in like headaches and head- yeah. Ha- yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. I had, when I, we're on theme. When I was on fire, like five, it was like I get really horrendous headaches and mum have to get taken me to the doctor. And it was um, stress and anxiety from. Like, and you would have MRIs. Yeah. Did you yeah. have hair extensions? 
uh, just the I got the clipless one. <laughs> oh, great. So That's you, good. Oh, so you were smarter than me. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I... I cared about my appearance because of my dad, so I had to get the clip. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no son of mine will have non-MRI hair extensions. <laughs> so, I mean, did you feel different to your friends and other kids? It's funny because you're also ADHD, right? You're one of us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you've, so you've really got all the letters, by the way. He's yeah. overachiever. <laughs> so, yeah. Or were it, you just fighting for your life, full stop, emotionally? You just know what you know. Yeah. So it's not till like after I left school that I had like all this weird sort of stuff. See, I had happen. a sense when I was walking amongst really? kids that I didn't belong there. Yeah, I don't know. Like, you were just, it sounds like you were just in it. Yeah, I was just in it and... Surviving. Like, then you, then, like, you look back and you, like... Yeah, hindsight. Yeah, like, uh, even, you know, risk-taking stuff. Oh, it's yeah. like, when I was, I just, I only thought of it the other day, like, when I was, like, 10, mum used to work full-time and then I had a couple of mates from school. I was really quiet in primary school, but mm. then, so at school I was really good, but then, like... Me and these nutty mates would like rush back to my house and we'd get cans of bug spray mm. and light candles around the house and like make flamethrowers. <laughs> mum doesn't know. Just good, clean fun. <laughs> hey, mum. Yeah. Piss off, dad. Hello, mum. <laughs> um, and like light bonfires. On well, that's one veranda. of the insidious oh. things. On the veranda. Yeah. Uh, Contained. Mate. But you can see. <laughs> I wrote off my first three cars for dopamine. So, I mean, look at my body. I'm covered in tattoos. You're talking yeah. to a fe- your fellow risk taker. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. You yeah. can also see in our oppressively gendered world, particularly of the 2000s, I'm assuming this is, yeah. uh, 90s, 2000s, no, 2000s. 2000s. Born yeah. 92, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah. Um, then it was yeah. just boys being boys. Yeah, boys yeah. being boys. Boys, yeah. being boys. Yeah. boys being boys. Boys being boys. And if you went quiet for a bit, I imagine this boys being boys as well. Like that's just what, uh, like the hedonism aspects of this, unfortunately, are qualities that we seem to just sort of, I don't know, not raise an yeah. eyebrow out when it comes to... I mean, if That's you true. were lighting flame... Th- you did! I did. You did. I did. To like a prayer video in your... I, um, I recreated the Madonna like a prayer video in our lounge room and set it on fire. Mm, mm. <laughs> but to be fair, that was... Same, a, it sounds camper. like more of an artistic pursuit and also a homage. Yeah, ours was just yeah. danger yeah. for the sake of danger. There's something, Michael, give me... There's something that I you wrote that made me... Um, made me cry that this book... And I think this is enough to sell the book to anybody. It was... For years you search, berate and hope. You wander, you wander wounded, then the answer arrives and it's not a resolution. It's the beginning of understanding. I was like, oh, bitch. Mm. I mean, I've cried enough these last few days. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, when you, when you, when you, get, you get the knowledge about yourself that, that reframes everything, all your core beliefs, how you've kind of viewed yourself for most yeah. of your life, you're right, it's... It's not like the resolution. It's not like, oh, it's like, okay, now I'm starting again. Yeah. So when did you, so you guys met, had you been diagnosed with bipolar when you started no, working? No. 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 Okay. War so, dogging. So, you, were just, so, you were. Well, I'm interested yeah. to know between, say, leaving high school and, you know, starting work, what was happening for you mentally? Like how were you dealing with it? Not very well. Right. Um, did you know it, you were depressed? Yeah, yeah, depressed, anxious, like it was sort of all over the shop in terms of, and I did go on antidepressants and I had anxiety stuff, but and they just said general depression, not general. Right, there's shit going on. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, was and it connected to your father and childhood. background? Did that had those sort of links been made? Well, were you still sort of in the too much in the middle of it, it all? With the sort of dealing with the, like, the actual repressed emotional stuff. It mm. was like I went to th- the counsellor in high school mm. and I pulled out of that because you don't want to be the kid getting no. help no. and I went to an all-boys school. Oh, oh. Jesus. Um, in Sydney. Yeah. Double Jesus. Yeah, I know. Yeah, right. That's, it's a clusterfuck. That's not good. It's a clusterfuck. Yeah, yeah. That's you're just in the wrong place. Yeah. Mm. On several levels. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I, yeah. Well, I w- well done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I just want to say, well done on being here today. Yeah. Thanks. No, genuinely. Oh, thank you. Yeah. We're, we're making eye contact. Two people don't make eye contact. It's yeah. a lot. Mm. It's okay that we're safe. Yeah. Yeah. All okay. Good. And okay. then and then I tried to, oh, look, when I was 21, I had a full-blown mental breakdown. Mm-hmm. 
ambulance, taken to hospital, suicide watch. Um, after that, I started writing. Yeah. So that was the f- me trying to make sense of things. But I, I, I remember I went to a psychologist at that time and I still wasn't accepting all the shit that had been happening. Mm-hmm. So I sort of went without really wanting it to help, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, you, know, yeah like, you specify that, that like going to see a therapist or psychologist, you kind of need to go wanting wanting the help yeah. rather than if you're going in sort of defensive, it's well, really Well, you're a straight man too. Like you're not exactly encouraged by society to yeah to help mm. yourself yeah. mentally. Like it's almost seen as a weakness if you go to a psychologist. Yeah. And not that's, now, hopefully, but. Yeah, uh, hopefully not you're now. You're helping and, to fix that. Well, yeah, I, I'm very fortunate with the the circle of my straight mates around me have have definitely become a lot more emotionally available as we've got older, which I know in sort of previous decades that wouldn't be the case. Yeah. You sort of just oh, become hardened down. and shut uh, and mm. shut down and but yeah, I think it's really I was fortunate that when I was going through all this, um my friends really opened up to the the pathways of you know telling each other you love each other mm-hmm. and and that support network so that was really massively important and, and like impressive from my you know a lot of people didn't know how to take it because they didn't really know what it was but they wanted to be so is available that the bipolar you mean specifically yeah. so talk yeah. me to me about that diagnosis so you were so you knew you were depressed you had the 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 mental breakdown you started writing yeah and, and then it was kind of in the wilderness for a long time and, yeah, not not wanting to accept that. I knew, I think I knew it was for about five years by the time I got diagnosed with bipolar yeah. that it was that. Yeah. But wow. as I was saying, you go through these periods where you feel okay yeah, and then you go, maybe I'm overreacting totally. or maybe I'm not. Uh, I'm just not dealing with things well mm. or so you try and convince yourself actually I'm fine. Yeah. And then you go through like this huge like emotional where you just you cannot even put into words what what I have mm. but you actually yeah. have <laughs> you, you <laughs> also yeah, yeah I mean I mean I know I'm interested to know before we get to the book cuz I just it's so beautiful we'll talk about your friend who illustrated it and the way you've written it is like it's like the soul had a pen. Like I was reading and going, Jesus, this guy's like, I think a lot of people are going to resonate with specifically the way you describe the experiences you're yeah, having. I hope so, yeah. No, it's incredible. So, but I'm just interested to know what finally led you to biting the bullet because a lot of women listen to our show, like yeah. that's going to shock you ever high. Um, but, you know, the mental health of our husbands is something that's really prevalent on a lot of minds. I get a lot of messages and a lot of emails about men struggling to deal with their emotions. And so I'm really interested to know what got you there in the end to, the, to I, get the diagnosis. Yeah, I think it was, it felt as desperate as survival, I think, at that point. Yeah, right. Because I just couldn't keep having the internal and also putting out the front to everyone that you're exhausted from the masking yeah 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 so it was just at a point and I got diagnosed on the first day of lockdown oh That's you're joking wow the first day yeah and then so they said to you you're, you're, you're bipolar <laughs> yeah I was saw, this via a zoom or in person it was in person so i I think it's locked down later that day, but I ended up having to see three GPs, a psychiatrist, and I was already seeing a psychologist. Oh, my gosh. So, and then they just sort of said, look, for the next three to six months, we're going to try you on medications. So, essentially, you're a guinea pig for that time, like so where they're trying to get it right. Lockdown was okay in that aspect? Do, do you think it was? Well, the bitter pill was they said it's going to, intensify your symptoms in that time. <laughs> so you're going to get heightened anxiety and depression. Right. And I was living in a shit box on Cleveland Street in Surrey Hills. Um, Very right around the corner from where I used to he live. He lived in a shit box on really? Cleveland Street in Surrey Hills. This was Hills. a shit box. Well, we were on a side street. He means he was right oh, on the right. traffic. You were right. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So maybe I could sleep. It was just the traffic that was killing me. <laughs> the loca- You're on a yeah. main road, babe. It's not an ideal location. Get an eye mask in a quiet room. <laughs> that we is don't a cure it. 
I can't believe. And and also uh, other friends that I know that have had bipolar. It's like it's it, when you say guinea pig, they are experimenting to get the balance right, yeah. which is different for every person. Yeah. Can Can you explain the the swing, like the the yeah yeah. So now it's much less. So mm. I say like. Well, if your average person experiences emotions at zero to 10, I'm maybe minus five to 15 now. Mm -hmm. But before it was like off the scale. And the tricky thing was I could be hour to hour Mm -hmm. hypermanic to depressive. So I could be like really up and then all of of a sudden crying. And also that surprised me and confused me because my understanding of bipolar, which comes from our parents' colleagues in the 80s, mm-hmm. which who were all undiagnosed. I <laughs> worked in a hospital, not into diagnosis, but it was called manic depression at the time. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I remember, because my mum my, my was pretty good about explaining to me, and I remember they would go through long states of depressive states and then manic states and that you could see as soon as you saw their faces. Like, I mean, obviously it was their behaviour and everything like that, but actually you could see it in the way they were hol- holding themselves, Yeah, that they were like a different personality, but it was long periods of time. So, But you were flipping on it like potentially well, it would depend on the like because i would go through long states of it mm. but then there were some i don't know if it was particularly chaotic or if there was you know the repressed stuff that i was mm. wrestling with the subconscious that i was wrestling with that would you know if it's a high high level of anxiety or like that can that can sort of be the conduit between hypermania and depressive mm-hmm. because, you know, it's kind of like if you get so anxious. It can flip either way. Yeah, it mm-hmm. could flip you into like depressive because you just feel so depressed about all the anxious thoughts. Mm-hmm. But if it's just running like your motor and you're just constantly energised by that anxiety, that sort of leads. So it could just flip. But I would experience, that was the weird thing. It was like I would experience long periods of hypermania, like weeks or, and then. Is that when you're writing days. scripts in two days? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, I remember like. I, when I, you were working with Michael, is that how you were? Yeah, but then there's the, the hyperfixation thing. Yeah, yeah, like so you love writing. Yeah. So you're, you're in there. If it's something you love. You're switched it's just on, like, you're not anxious. The only time I'm really not anxious is when I'm doing what I love. Yeah. Same as you. Yeah. Yeah, you're on track. It's like tunnel vision. Same. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's such a relief. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah, it's That's like. That's why we work all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah. I crave it. Like, yeah. I, it's, it's weird. Like I step out onto stage in front of all these people and I just feel peace. Yeah, right. Like for one fucking moment. Yeah. I'm doing the thing I'm meant to do that I'm really good at, that I love doing, that I'm really interested in, and that's all I'm thinking about. So my brain is not spiraling off into the nine thousand other things I should be worried about, anxious about that I will find. Yeah, yeah. At three o'clock of the morning the next day. Yeah. But I get it. Of course, you would choose to write a script in two days if you're locked in. Do you forget to go to the toilet? I do. Eat. <laughs> I will we'll forget to sleep. It's everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And at that, did you have anybody? See, I've got people around me now that know that say, hey, you know, but were you by yourself when you were? In this place in Surrey Hills, did you have people around you? I was in a relationship, but we weren't living together. Right. And, 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 you know, there was like that separation where it's like, oh, I'll be writing tonight till Got it. 4 or 5 a.m. Yeah. Mm. You know, like that's, yeah. It, but by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. It was the so way I, mean, I was like, dealing okay. with shit. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, do you still write like that now? Like maybe not to that extent, but now that you're quote unquote healthy ish. Yeah. yeah. Do you, is that how you still create? Yeah. Same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> evil laugh, evil laugh. I'm um, such a boring nine to fiver. It's terrible. Oh, he's so the way. So what? He in sits there in a cafe and oh, business no, hours writing. Look, no. it's fine. Too much stimulus in um, a cafe. What are you doing? Oh, right. I like it. The I hum have like of a life. horse in a stable with blinkers on. Yeah. Same. I, 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 I did used to be a bit more like that, but I had to sort of train myself because I always had to be in the production office, so I had no choice. It's like the scenes were delivered and I can't control what's around me, so I've just got to like learn how to yeah. do it. You know but it's a skill that I've built up too well. Like I can be... You're very good. The world can be ending yeah. and someone can be saying, sure. I... <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm like, sorry? But the thing is, he surrounds himself with people like us. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Just what does that say? You mainline our energy. I, I, I do. I think I ended up getting a dog that has reflected me, though. <laughs> what have you got? <laughs> Uh, like a mutt, like he's a Jack beautiful. Russell? 
No, oh. uh, Staffy Boxer, we think. We think. I love it. The other one is a complete fucking mystery. Oh. Like, we think he's half possum. There's just this bushy oh. tail thing. But Harold is... Good name. Yeah. <laughs> Harold and Maud. But oh, oh, Harold and Maud. Favourite. Yeah, favourite. No, Beaches is my uh, favourite, but I do love Harold and Maud. Um, um, no, but I want to know, you got diagnosed first day of yep. lockdown, you find out you're bipolar. Yep. Then you what? go on the drug guinea pig. Yeah, you drug guinea pig. Yep. So how, how long ago? How many years ago are we talking now? Four. Okay. Twenty eight. Yeah. Yeah. Twenty eight. Um, how long did it take to stabilize? So they like, said, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm at a twelve. <laughs> um, I think they they said three months, and then they were like, ah, oh, it's more like six. Oh. Better that you don't know. Yeah. Let's well, not talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then yeah. it started, like, it, it, you started seeing a real difference, though, like once once I'd been on the right uh, combination of medications. And isn't that it just like a shit fucking so insane science experiment? Now, how yeah. many tablets are you on? Are you okay well, to talk about your medication? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So um, too late. I'm on 11 now. So to, to function. A day. Yeah. 11 And a they're day. daily. Yes. So I've got... I've got to take two lamotrigine in the morning. What does that do for you? Mood stabiliser. Mood stabiliser. Two lithium in the morning, five lithium in the evening, and then that's another mood stabiliser, and then two quetiapine. Yep, the sleeping ones. Yep. Yep. To sleep. Wow. Mm. So it's a bit of admin. It is. I know. I, 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 I would, <laughs> and have you had times where you've forgotten? About the Just no, or no, no. Them. No, never forget. No, no. no nev- it's like... His life it, literally depends on it. Yeah. It's like I'm terrified of the prospect of having to readjust or like it's And just, for an ADHD-er, yeah. she's sus. Yeah, That's I a know. a lot to remember. I remember watching the Magic Johnson doco and he was like, I have to take one pill a day. And it's exhausting. <laughs> I'm like, fuck off. <laughs> fuck you. Yeah. a pill. Can't, I've got 11. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we should talk yeah. about this beautiful yeah, book. So okay. the, Please. The, the way that the book works is what Xavier's done is he's, described all the different states of bipolar and sort of so it sort of roughly works like we start with more of the depressive states and then we go all the way to the grandeur and (laughs) and so you sort of describe what the state is but then you give us like what i would describe as like the thought track of what's going on in your head what your stream of consciousness and then also you then give us these incredible illustrations and these sort of descriptions of sort of fantastical imaginings of what it feels like but uh, let me describe, I'll start with at the bottom because this was the melancholia one and, and I, I think I was attracted to this because I can relate to this kind of thinking, although not at the intensity. This is like your stream of consciousness thought track for melancholia. So you have to imagine this is Xavier rattling around his house feeling this sort of intense depression. I should probably speak to someone, but what would I say if they ask how I am? Lie. Don't bother. You just bring them down. It's the middle of the day and they're all at work anyway. Normal jobs with applicable skills. I wish I had skills or I knew how to be useful. What if the toilet broke? I couldn't fix it. Need to get the plumber in. The plumber would come in confident and be like, I can fix this toilet and I have to just stand there and say, I don't have any skills. I'm sorry. I bet you the toilet does break today now. Why would I wish that upon myself? If it happens, I've only got myself to blame. I'm a skillless individual. That's what I am. I just have to live with it. An insignificant and skillless man. So you're flipping all over the place and grinding yourself down, down, yeah. down. There's no avenue that your brain will let you go to like in any way uptick. Yeah, because it's it's like a symptom is also feels like physiological as well. So there's like the, the body intensity of it as well. So it's like the energy to fight off a state like that, you just don't have it. Mm. And also your mind won't like allow you to get those easy outs yeah it's like you can it's they're they're easy to get out of like to try and avoid or try and move away from it it's like Mm. it's just all sort of lumping towards like Mm. yeah and this is a this image now let's talk about your friend who did the illustrations because my this one is fatigue Oh. And and the sort of description that you have is possessing a body so dense it houses bones made of steel, concrete and cartilage and sand-filled muscles covered in aluminium. You're at the bottom of a set of winding stairs. And, uh, I mean, you, it goes longer than that, but that that's the sort of really vivid yeah. kind of imagery all the way through it. So he's taken these sort of very pungent descriptions and put them and, like, I mean... Was that the only direction... So the illustrator is a friend of yours. Yeah, he's one of my best mates, and um, that one's intrusive thoughts. 
And Michael wants that on a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I do love that one. I know. Um, and What's his name, your friend? Michael Arvethus. He is incredible. Uh, so we've been friends for 10, 10 plus years now mm-hmm. and um, we've always been very open about each of our struggles and he's been incredibly supportive of me. Mm. Um and I, uh, he's just incredible and I've just always wanted to find a project that we could collaborate on and this was just the perfect thing. I, I know how incredible he is. So I just wrote that, the, you know, that stanza and handed it over to him. And, and that was just, it? That yeah. was the key. Wow. That's amazing. This, this one's risk-taking behaviour, which is a wild yeah, image. and and there, well, I this I was obsessed with this. This is how you describe grandeur and what's going on in your head with grandeur. The world needs me. I'm like no other person that's ever existed. I'm not of this stock standard IKEA personality beige bullshit. Off kilter, wide, wired. Sorry, weird and wonderful because I know I'm something special. My brain is different. It operates on a different frequency. And for those who don't see it yet, they're in for a treat because when you see it, you won't be able to unsee it. Your lives will change. You will invest, reinvest, and be enamoured with me. Just you wait. Winston Churchill had bipolar, and he got through a world war. We're in symbiosis. All of us in that one percent. <gasps> Woo! Where is the lie? <laughs> <laughs> that is, I mean. Please write my bio. <laughs> that's like, sounds like the best drugs I've ever been on in my life. Not that I've ever, I mean, I don't know, but. I mean, I've been there a couple of times, yeah. but yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, you've ne- <laughs> How, what's the longest time that you would stay in a state like that? Well, see, that's the alluring one yeah. as well. Like that's the one that you would, hear it, people go off the meds because of that. And, and, <laughs> and is that hard to, like, I mean, here's a really cliched impression of bipolar, like. Oh, I, like, and you do you discuss this? There are movies that are about this. It's like, oh, I want the highs, and I, I think want the Jordan lows. Belafonte, The Wolf of Wall Street, like that's how what oh. I think. You know how he would get in those, but they were probably more cocaine highs than well. Yeah. And Garden yeah. State highs. with Zach Braff, which was a movie I remember really oh well, but I remember God. that whole. You hate that. You hate no, that I representation. Hate, I hate it. Yeah, his whole the whole because the pills are seen guy. as a weakness. Yeah, it's and it's lithium. Yeah, I rewatched it again. Like I tried to re- rewatch Silver Linings Playbook, and I just felt like punching myself in the face. It's hard. Oh. It's hard when yeah you're unique experience is so poorly done. Yeah. If, and then if, Garden State, it was Zach Braff from the outset going, I want to get off lithium. Why? And, and, I'm, and I'm sitting there going like, I'm here because of lithium. Oh, God. Yeah. You know, like. But, so powerful. But not to give any credence to the way that film um, depicted it, but in that instance it was like because I, like he, what I imagine was he misses what you were describing yeah, there. Yeah. So what, so, like, and uh, is that a factor of it or is it that no, even at, when you go to the bandwidth of 15, that's enough of a taste of it for you? Yeah. Well, I, I just remembered I didn't ask. It, like it could, maybe that could state could last like a, a few days or something, you know, so it's. I'm it's, presuming that's also often accompanied with no sleep. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Mm. Yeah, so there's trade offs. You got to pay for it. Yeah, on the other side. Yeah, but it's 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 very. It's now I get it to a lesser extent. Like if I write something that I'm really proud, you know, you yeah. get that elated feeling. We and call them glimmers of, now. Yeah, it's right. Like, it's like like electric joy. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. and and it's hard because I still have bipolar. Mm. I I still it's not fixed. It's a chronic disease, mm-hmm. so I am managing it. It's not cured because I mm. take mm. 11 pills a day. Mm. So it's still hard to recognise those. Like you can sort of subconsciously recognise like, oh, maybe I'm going up, but then it's mm. it's the, the battle will always be trying to manage that, mm. Mm. catching it before it gets there and then, you know, doing mm. the dance of like, hang on, what are the things I need to put in place to... Mm. Uh, Did Carrie from Homeland have bipolar? Yeah. Yeah, because her whole Tried thing was like basically American national security depended on her being not on meds. Like... Are you, like, are you saying that film and TV are getting <laughs> a depiction of nuanced mental and cerebral issues? I would never say such a thing. Um <laughs> <laughs> why did you why did you do this? Because this would have been a massive undertaking for you emotionally. Because you it know, was. and we all know as writers, when you want to do the material justice, you gotta go and fucking live it. So yeah, when you were when it you was were yeah. Full on because that's kind of what I felt like 
when I was writing each symptom because I write it in a way where it's like the first stanza is like quite literally what this is and then it's stream of consciousness and then the little story. Yeah. Like and that's t- the perfect way to lay it out too, thank you. Very, very readable. Oh, uh, yeah, because yeah. I, 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 I was hoping that it could reach each sort of type of thin- thinker, you know, it, literal it or does. analytical yep. or creative. But you do have to sit in that, mm-hmm. especially when it's stream of consciousness. Mm-hmm. You're like, oh, okay, now what is it like to feel hopeless? Yeah, I'm tracking back, back to there. Yeah, it's horrible. Yeah, so it, I, I, I wrote it because... When I was 18, I just wish I had something like this. Yeah. Mm. What you do know? you have, can I ask? Like like even now, like apart from what you've just written, what do you get given for this? Like I imagine you get given things that feel like textbooks and... That's, that, that well, was the, the internet, issue. Just fucking overwhelming yeah. and full of bullshit. Or a pamphlet. Or a pamphlet. Oh, don't they love a pamphlet? Yeah, they love a pamphlet. So you made what you needed. Which yeah. Is where the best I, things come from. I think we have... Uh, in what I'd come across, it was very analytical or entirely anecdotal. Like I wanted to do something that was also a creative expression as well. So hopefully people who are like really creative and uninterested in like theory and mm. science, it could they could find it. But the most important thing is that it's your lived experience often times there are conversations I find especially around autism that happen without autistic people's involvement. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Nothing about us without us, that idea. Yeah. And I think this book is going to be so powerful because it's your lived experience. You haven't gone and researched it. You've fucking been in the trenches with it. Yeah. And that's why it's powerful. Yeah. Uh, and also, I, for, you know, not having bipolar, for me what was great about it was, like when I go back to being a kid and being told by my parents that person has manic depression, I would look at them and they would, to be honest, I would be a little bit like, put off by it because I felt like I, I don't understand what's happening mm. and I don't, it's a little bit scary for me. Mm. And, and, but the interesting thing about this is even though these states are so extreme in the way that you describe them and break them down, I, I, and uh, though I'd never feel it on that level, I do, un- I understand, I understand it more. And, and in some ways it's really helpful to know it's not like it's an unfamiliar human no. emotion. Mm. It's actually really relatable human emotions, but turned up to 11 mm. and, yeah. and, f- and, and, like I feel like this book, it, it's a beautiful roadmap for bi- for bipolar yeah, and yeah. for people who just want to understand yeah. Yeah, bipolar, that's, like that's where yeah. you go. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, uh, you know, feedback coming in from people is just like even people who are reading it just from their own standpoint of like, oh, I've experienced anxiety. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. or. Yeah. Melancholy, like, just, totally. You know, relating in that way too. Which or is, I just really love myself so much. And <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just really, really, really grand. Well, hold it up. Hold hold it up. It up. Now, where are we buying this? Where are we getting it from? How can everybody get a copy? Uh, well, if you just. You we'll can put a go, link up. Yeah, we'll yeah, send yeah, it. Yeah. We'll send it. <laughs> All right, here we go. You can't hear it, but I think there's applause on. Thank you very much, Xavier. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. you. Perfect. Brilliant. Okay, gang. Well, that is the end of our monster episode, main episode. I want to thank Xavier Coy for coming in um, to talk about his incredible book, Living With Bipolar. Ben will send all the details in the newsletter on how to get it. And I um, also want to thank all the staff at Box Hill Hospital and the two paramedics looked after me. And I want to thank my husband, Scott. <gasps> he did really well. Yeah, he came through. He's, good. He's crisis good. He's great. He, he really kept me calm when I called him. And imagine receiving a phone call from your spouse and the opening line is, I think I'm dying, please help me. Mm, like, that's pretty traumatic. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah. He was also very good text contact. He was communicating. Yeah. Yes. Just the right amount of information. Good. I told Individual, him. but then also a group. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nailed well, it. Well, I think he was probably having, sadly, flashbacks. He was having to do the same for his dad. And I was really acutely aware of that, you know, it would have been quite triggering for Scotty having that scenario again and, you know, in a Mm. hospital in crisis. And so, um, yes, it's been a big, a big few days, few weeks. I'm okay. I'm getting there. I'm going to go back and see my psychologist and do all the things. Um, But thank you for listening. And don't forget, you can watch us on YouTube. You can also come and see me live on December the 7th at Margaret Court Arena. If you want to see Outgrown for the final time, it's the last time I'll be performing it, putting her to bed. And um, don't forget to also go to our Instagram and comment on our reels, share them, like them, interact with our social media. All of that helps us. 
Coming up next, though, is the sealed section where Michael will be reviewing Lady Gaga's The Joker sequel. I think Joaquin Phoenix is in it also. Apparently. And also you saw the Robbie Williams bio. Yes, which is not being released for 100 days. So I saw it way hot off the presses. And it's weird, I've checked, I can talk about it. Amazing. (laughs) Which is a sign of confidence. I also got invited to the Wicked premiere in Sydney. Ah! Talk about that. And find out who I'm going to be interviewing. That's all in the sealed section. If you want to listen, you have to be a subscriber to Emsolation Extra. You know you should. Why wouldn't you? It's our premium service. It's good. All right. See you later. Bye. Bye. Give yourself the gift of Emsolation Extra for less than two dollars a week and get two bonus episodes every week, close friends access on Instagram, pre-sales, ticket priority, and merch discounts. There's even exclusive video episodes each week on our extra extra tier. Find out more at emsolation.supercast.com now. Emsolation with M. Rossiano is recorded at Down the Hill Studios. Hosted by M. Rossiano with Michael Lucas. Executive produced by Benjamin Worsley. Produced by M. Rossiano. Edited by Ezekiel Fan with videos by James Henderson. Socials by Benjamin Worsley, M. Rossiano and Marcella Rossiano Barrow. With assistance from Jem Evans and Isabella Hines. You'll find links to get more M. Salation on Instagram at M. Salation Podcast. Thanks for listening and we can't wait to chat with you again soon. <laughs>